Um, we're going to look this morning at a uh, very well-known Bible passage. I'm glad some of the young people was, were able to stay in because this will be one you'll know and you'll learn some things, I think, from it. We're going to go. Before you go, I'm going to tell you where the passage is and then see how you remember the story. The story is in 1 Samuel 17. Now, can you tell me the two, two main characters of this story? You could have sub-characters, but there's two main characters. Or tell me what the story is. Okay, 1 Samuel 17. Let me remember. Okay, well, let me tell you where the setting is. The setting is in the Valley of Elah. They're going to give you pictures up there. They know to hit that. They have my outline. There we go. Now that is, see right there in the middle, you can see the Valley of Elah right up there. See that up there where the hand is? Okay. That is where this story takes place. And uh, somebody get it right, you knew what the story was? And uh, then now the, the, the opponents in this story are the Philistines. And the Bible tells us, you can turn it to 1 Samuel 17, that in verse 1, that the Philistines pitched between Soko and Azekah. Now, I have been over to Israel, and, uh, but I've not been to this area. I went when I was a young man. My dad promised me uh, that was a gift that he gave me. And uh, in fact, Ethan, that was a gift my dad gave me for graduating from high school. I was trying to remember that. And uh, he said, uh, and it was strictly Israel. He said, but I went to Bible college. Actually, I graduated from Bible college before I went to Israel. So I learned stories. That's a good thing. So I knew where a lot of these stories were, but I never went to this place. So when I was there, there was a lot going on. I mean, there was, there was fighting 30 miles. There is a lot going on, right, all the time. But I mean they were close to us. We were down in, the, in Galilee, and they were fighting 30 miles north of us. And I did not feel safe. I mean, figure 30 miles. What's that, Lebanon or a little further? And that's not very far away. People can, can get at you pretty quick. So my dad, after it was over, he said, uh, do you want to come back and start a tour? Because that's what they were kind of doing. It was all Israel they wanted to bring back. I said, Dad, the next tour I want to go on, I think I'll do a Bible study to Hawaii. That's where I want to go. <laughs> so I've, go I've been there and, got and gone. But some people love to go, and that's fine. I had a friend that went, he's in heaven now, he went 38 times. Yeah, he went everywhere. And, uh, and people like to, to go. Um, my preacher, I think, has been a couple times. But some people like to go and then take tour after tour after tour. But I've never been to this spot. But that is what, where the Philistines are in the beginning of this story in 2 Samuel, or excuse me, 1 Samuel 17. And that's what it looks like. Okay, now the Israelites in verse 2, I believe it is, um, in 3, Saul comes out of the area of Gibeah and, um, and that Jerusalem area and comes up through and comes into that valley. And he gets over on the adjoining hill. And uh, he looks across. That's the next picture. That's what he looks. So he looks down into that valley. And uh, now let's talk about the main characters. Who was the main character that went down into that valley and started challenging the Israelites? You remember his name? That's right. Goliath is the guy that changed. Now, David, we're going to introduce in a minute. But Goliath, he's mentioned first in verse 4. There went out a champion among the a camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. We figure conservatively that he was nine feet six inches. That's pretty tall. That's real tall. I've never seen anybody that tall. But in the Bible, there are giants spoken of many times. If we take time, we could show you 20 different passages that giants are talked about. The oldest book in the Bible that we believe written, now Genesis covers the beginning, but Moses, we believe God used him to write it. But Job, probably the oldest written book of the Bible, he talks about a giant. In uh, Job chapter number 16, 14, he said this. Now remember, he's suffering. He says, he runneth upon me like a giant. Well, you get a run over by a giant, you'd know it, I'm sure. So Job knew what giants were back then, and he talks about it. 
There are other places. You remember the story when the Israelites came out of uh, Egypt and they were going to the promised land. They'd gone about a year or so and now it's time to go in. They send the spies and 10 spies came back and said, we can't go in there. They got giants over there, the sons of Anak. You remember that? And uh, Caleb and, jo and Joshua said, we can whip them. In fact, when Joshua, excuse me, when Caleb got there 40 years later, he said, I'll take that mountain where they are. In Deuteronomy, I, did, I only caught this a couple of years ago reading through the Bible, and I like to read the Bible through less than every year. And, uh, uh, and I encourage people, read the Bible, because you learn things. You say, oh, I read the Bible once. I read the Bible. The Bible's a living book. You'll learn every day. God will give you something that day you may need to so read the Bible. But I was reading through the Bible here the last time, the time for last. And in Deuteronomy 3.13, there was a place in Israel that was referred to as, before at least, as they got there, the land of the giants. That's what they called that place. And they changed the name to Bashan. But it was referred to, and that verse says so, the land of the giants. I think they met a TV program years ago called Land of the Giants. I think it was on Sunday nights, so I never saw it. But uh, it was an old program about space guys landing and, and another planet, and everybody's bigger than them. But uh, this was a real place in the, the Holy Land, or uh, the Bible Land. Some people call the Holy Land Kentucky. But uh, <laughs> I remember old guy used to say it, but being paid used to say that. But, uh, uh, but the Bible lands. Did you ever uh, meet a really tall guy? Give me the next picture. I was in an auction a few years ago. And I looked, and here came this big, tall guy in. And I thought, oh, man. And they, they mentioned, that's Rick Smits that used to play for the uh, Pacers. That's right. He liked signs, and they were having some time at sign auction. I said, can I have a picture with you? He said, okay. That was a difference. He's only seven foot four. Look at the guy down in the corner. He's laughing. <laughs> he thinks it's funny. Look at the difference in that. But he's not nine foot six. He's not a giant like Goliath. But there have been some guys bigger than Rick Smith's. In fact, there was a guy that went to a Baptist college. The biggest man in recorded that we know of in modern times. I'm talking about the last couple hundred years ago when they could take a picture of him. But uh, he went to a Baptist college called Shortlift College. And it's over in, um, it's no longer right now, but they use some of the buildings still. But it was started in 1827 for preacher boys, kind of like our school, just started as a small school. 1827, you know, it, that's pretty early. Um, our little community of Hopewell wasn't started until 1825. And so you go to, this is in Alton, Illinois, which is, Alton is just, a little bit north of St. Louis. It's right there on the Mississippi River. But uh, about 1938, they had a fellow named Robert Wadlow that joined their college. And uh, he was rather tall. In fact, uh, he was a lot taller than the president and the dean of students. He, was, uh, he kept growing, but uh, he, he got to 8 foot 11. Well, look at him with his family. Now, he wasn't of a family of giants. Um, how, how would you like to see him in church? You'd notice him in here, I bet you. And uh, he just stood head and shoulders. How about his class? Uh, look, you'll look at it for a minute. You won't catch it, but you'll find him real quick. Way in the back above everybody. And that's a real person. Um, I knew we were over there ministering in a church just north of there. And so we had stayed in St. Louis, and we were driving up there that morning. I said, there is a statue at that campus that they, they built of him after he passed away. He didn't live much longer. Only, he, he only lived to be, I forget how old, 28 or 29. Giants, especially back then, didn't live very long. Go back one. There was a brown, a bronze. They made a bronze of him, and that's what he looked like at 8 foot 9. He died at 8 foot 11. But uh, that's my one son that's 6 foot, and that is my my graduated son in between his legs right now. <laughs> so it's been a few years ago when he was small, but that is what he looked like. And uh, can you imagine? But Goliath was bigger than him. He was bigger than him. And the Bible says that Goliath was well-armed. I'm not going to take the time. Watch my time. I'm going to take a lot of that time. 
But I mean, he had mail on, he had the weapons, he had the spear, the shield, he had everything on. He was not only, you know, some guys are tall and they're not real coordinated. This guy was a warrior. And these giants, many of these giants that you read about in the Bible, he had brothers and all of them were warriors too. And you meet, you only hear about them on the battlefield and uh, being killed by somebody in battle, his four brothers. And so these guys were fighting giants. And so he would come out and he would challenge God's people. It says in verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. And if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, you'd look at that like the other the Israelites did and thought, there's no chance. I mean, hand-to-hand -hand combat with a guy that big, that well-armed, and nobody took him up on it. Well... He was very intimidating, and that was his purpose. Bible says that he did that 40 days that he came out. Nobody took up. In fact, later on, he must have been kind of taunting them because they ran and hid, as you find out in the story. Then enter the hero in verse number 12. Verse 12 says, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. So Jesse was old, and his youngest son, we know that from chapter 16, named David, who was already anointed by Samuel. And we find out that uh, David has three brothers that are in the army. So the older brothers that Samuel thought he was supposed to remember that story, God said, I'm going to want you to go no anoint another king, go to Bethlehem. And this guy, Jesse, is the guy who's going to have the sons. And so he's standing there, and he's watching his sons come in. Oh, that's the guy. Boy, does he look good. And God says, not the guy. That's the guy. No, that's not one either. And so God looks on the heart, not on what men look on, the outside. And he finally get David. Well, those three older ones are now in the battle. And David's not. Now, I bet David would have liked to. But his dad said, stay at home, watch the sheep. And he obeyed his dad. So that tells me that when God has a timing for everything. And so when you're a kid, you're a kid. When you're a teenager, you're a teenager. And you, when it's your time to be on the stage, um, a week ago, Monday, that little kid that I used to take care of got promoted to be a major in the Army. He's on the stage now. Okay? You had to take your time. And I, all kind of funny things happened when he was younger. And he was a good kid. But now it's his time. So his time, David, is starting to come. But yet he has one job to do. And in verse number um, 17, talks about him. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how their brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now we're introduced to the hero of the story, and what is he? He's a bread and cheese boy. That's what he is. That's what the Bible says. He's supposed to take bread and cheese, a little bit of parched corn, bring it to his brothers and to his commanding officer, the top dog. Jesse was, wasn't no dummy. He wanted them, his boys looked after Give him something, and uh, maybe they'll watch over. Ethan's going to camp uh, tomorrow, and, uh, and I gave him something to give to one of our graduates is down there for his, his son. He likes trains. I like trains. And, uh, and that will, I said, give that to him. That'll help him. You know, he'll watch out for him a little bit. In fact, last year he sent me pictures, what he was doing in that. Um, so he's no dummy. He was, Jesse was no dummy. Now here's the body. And I got to watch my time. Because the introduction is a lot of fun, too. Here's the body of this. And I call this, this message, Volunteers, Motivation, and Memories. 
And so number one, we have volunteers. You know, in the Civil War, and you've written a lot on the Civil War, I know, Mrs. Thompson, that 2.5 million soldiers, out of all those soldiers, only 46,000 were drafted. At least what I've read. 46,000. America's known for their volunteers. Even in the Vietnam War, there were more people with all the draft, you know, riots and that, that I was young, but I remember seeing them on uh, the news when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. It all, they, nobody wanted to be drafted, and they'd, uh, Kent State was not very far from us. But in all that, there were still, in the Vietnam War, more volunteers than there were people drafted. America, we volunteer. We even have a state named the volunteer state, don't we? Why? Well, wasn't a guy by the name of David Crockett and a bunch went down to the Alamo and made themselves famous? Yeah. Well, what does David do? He comes to the camp in verses 20 and 21, just as the Israelites are getting ready for battle, and David starts rooting for the team. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but this is the way I could see it. David gets there, and he sees them all getting ready. The Bible says that he hands off his stuff, and he's just ready. Go, guys. I could see him say, rah, rah, re, kick him in the knee. Rah, rah, ray, kick him in the other knee. You know, he's, he's <laughs> shouting, and he's yelling, and, and uh, what happens? Well, David was glad to be there. I think he'd have been earlier if his dad would have let him. But in verse 23 and verse 24, here comes Goliath like he's done the last 40 days. And everybody runs. Um, well, let me read it. It says, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Everybody ran but one person. At least according to that verse, all the guys he was talking to, it was David. He said, where you guys go? Where'd you guys go? He didn't run. He's a volunteer. That's the first thought. The second is the motivation. What was in it for David? You know, I, I heard this story about a, uh, there was a wealthy Texan. He owned a lot of land, a lot of oil. And uh, I think I read this story. And uh, he only had one child, and it was a girl, and she was ugly. And so he thought, i got to marry her off. I want grandkids. And so what he did was he had a very uh, large uh, banquet, and he invited all the eligible bachelors of all that area around Texas and brought them in. And he said, uh, I am going to, uh, after the party got going well, he took them all out to their Olympic-sized swimming pool, and they stood on one end, and he, he said, hey, he said, what I want to do is I'm going to offer you guys a challenge. They looked in, and sure enough, in that swimming pool, there was snakes, and there were fish, and there was an alligator or two. He said, the guy that can swim the end of that all the way to the other end, he said, I'll give you $100,000. Well, it perked their ears up. And uh, he said, if you don't want the $100,000, i will give you 1,000 acres of land with the oil rights. They thought about that. He said, and if you don't want that, you can have the hand of my daughter in marriage, and you can have it all when I'm gone. Well, no sooner had he said that there was a splash, and there was a the guy popped out at the other end. Well, he ran over there, and he patted the guy on the back, and the guy was dripping wet, and he patted and said, oh, man, and he said, that's great. You want 100000 He said, no. And you could see he was pretty well perturbed. He said, you want the 1,000 uh, the acres? He said, I don't want that either. He said, then you want my wife or my daughter for wife? He said, not at all. He said, well, what do you want? He said, I want the name of the guy that pushed me in on the other end. <laughs> you know, what motivates you? I thought that was interesting. We're motivated by different things. David was not motivated by the money. And they tell him what he could get. You're going to get this, this. You get the, the hand of the daughter of the king in marriage. And then your, your family's free. What does that mean? It means you don't pay taxes. <laughs> you don't have to pay taxes the rest of your life. Oh, that would be pretty good. But he wasn't interested in that. Let me say, if you serve the Lord, it won't be about the riches here. Now, God blesses us, 
and he's blessed me, and he's probably blessed you. But it's not about the, the riches. What does David say? He says in verse 29, is there not a cause? Let me remind us, the cause of Christ is so much bigger than what we can get out of it. Now, at this point, David, excuse me, Saul, is having a bad day. He is, was getting ready to go to battle, and he's watched his men all run off when one man stands in the valley and challenges them. And then he is told, there is a young guy out here. Um, it's interesting, David doesn't, or Paul, Saul doesn't seem to remember him because he used to be his little personal sound machine, you know, and make music. But it appears he doesn't, I don't know, maybe David has kind of grown up a little bit more and he doesn't recognize him. And, uh, but he, he has this young man, like David said, I'll, I'll take him on. And so he calls for him. And Saul is in disbelief in verse 33. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. He said, You can't do it, says Saul. Now Saul forgets how God had delivered him. He'd had some great deliverance a little bit. And that's our problem. Sometimes we forget what God does for us. I come down to school, and I may have a need, and I look at that roof, and I think, Man, God, you gave us a brand new roof. We, we didn't have $40,000, and you, we, we've got that there. And have to remember those things. And let God remind you when you get into an obstacle. Well, um, I like this. I probably ought to bring this out. David reminds what God has done and what he can do. Verse 34, after that negative, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Lions and bears, I, would, I don't want to mess with them. I went bear hunting one time just, for, I, just before I got married. And we didn't, we didn't get anything. And my dad said we were successful. He said, we didn't get a bear and they didn't get us. And uh, I've never hunted bears since then. He said, and I went out after him and smote him. That's the bear and the lion. And delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Now, I like verse 36. He says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. In verse 37, watch this. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of this philistine so two paws equal one hand he delivered me out of a paw of a of a, of a bear and and uh and that's how they can they can swat and take your head right off and uh they got power in those paws and out of the paw of the lion and uh the hand of that philistine i can take i like how the way he said that so Well, he gets armor, as you remember. He'd been criticized by his older brother. Now, that's interesting. Reading through the Bible this last time, that older brother that criticized him, he later becomes very instrumental in David in uh, watching over his kingdom. I forget what he's over, but David puts him in a very high position. So even an older brother that you didn't get along with can still do something for you and help you and help the Lord. Just keep reading your Bible. You'll find these little nuggets that are in there. You know, a miner has to dig for those things. You know, you get in a cave. It doesn't just gold fall on top of you. So get those nuggets out of the Bible. Well, let's go to, here is the third part, memories. The third part is memories. Okay? He goes down, the Bible says, to the brook. Now, there's only one brook in that valley. It's the brook Elah. There's only one. So you know what brook that is. So if you go over there, and this is what I wanted to do, go over to that brook and get a stone. Well, I didn't go over, but last year my brother was there. He has a man in his church that works for Mesa Airlines. You may not know that name. Mesa owns a lot of those planes that airlines fly. They own them, and so the guy gets to fly all over the world, and Daniel tags along. 
So he had a business trip somewhere in the Middle East. And my brother said, I won't be in Israel. I said, I know what I want for my birthday. He told me where he was going. And they hiked that, that uh, uh, Jerusalem, Jericho to Jerusalem track also, like the, um, the uh, Good Samaritan. They did that while they were over there. At least they did part of it. And he was going to go to the Valley of Eli. He said, get me a stone. And so he did. He said, I had to go through a lot of uh, wild stuff to get to this stone. But that is a stone out of the brook. And, uh, and I guarantee you, this is not the one that David used, okay? <laughs> this is the one he picked up and looked and said, ah, that's not quite right. And he put it down. I don't know if he had it in his hand or not. But it is from that, that uh, same brook, which I thought was pretty neat. And uh, I, I keep in show. But he gets, you know, he gets five of them. And uh, five selects five smooth stones. And uh, we don't know why, but we know later in the book that it tells us he had four brothers. And uh, he only uses one stone. And so then he goes to meet Goliath. And these, of course, are just artist conceptions. But he goes to meet, and that old giant, he just disdains David he said, am I a dog? He uses that word. Am I a dog? You come and bring a little kid like this to fight me. And David, he testifies to him. He said, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. Now he alliterated, S-S-S. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I shall smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the, uh, of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts. I'm going to beat you, and we're going to beat your army. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Not that David is a great warrior, but that God delivers. Now, when this little talk goes on, and Goliath is just cursing the gods of Israel and defying, he only has moments to live. Now, he doesn't know that, but David's pretty sure of it. And he says, God's going to deliver you. And so the conflict comes, and you know what David did. He got that rock, and he threw it. My dad used to say when he'd preach and talk about this passage, he said, old David, he could flang it that way, but that stone was going to get Goliath. It didn't matter. He, just, he was good at his instrument, and shepherds are. They use that to get, move things around and get things away they're just good at their, at their old, and you, you know it's not a, I always thought for about, oh, 10 years when I was a kid, he, he used a whammo, but, uh, but it's a strap, you know, with a string, and you wind that thing up, and then you let one in go, and it got him in the one vulnerable spot, right in the head, and he falls down, and then David, who doesn't have a sword, takes the sword of Goliath and pulls it out, and he chops the head off. And this artist has it right, I think. I can kind of see him hold that old head right up there and say, we got the big one. The rest of us are taking you, Philistines. And the Philistines ran. The closest thing I ever saw to that was 1985 when we brought the school over. We got here early before we got all the things. And I was staying with my grandma. And I would get in the morning and I'd drive early in the morning to the college and begin work. And so... I was driving, it was kind of a misty morning, it was this time of year, and there was a pond that they had there in the um, apartment complex, and I saw two boys on the other side fishing. And so I love to fish, so I just kind of watch them as I just slowly, uh, you can only go 10 or 15 miles an hour, and I'm going. And so I saw one guy, one little kid, they were 10 or 11, he, he got down in the water, he just he jumped, ran into the, and I saw him hold up, and, he, and the other kid is holding this line, and he pulls up this big catfish. Now, for his size, it may have only been this big, but it was everything he could go. And so he goes like this, and he brings it up to the shore, and he throws it down. About that time, he looks, and he sees across the, the pond that I'm watching in this car. And I've pulled over into the gravel by now watching. And he looks at me, and he put his foot down on the head of that big old catfish, and he goes, That's what I feel like David did. It showed him this is it. God delivers, and we're going to win this battle today. 
And of course, they did. They triumphed. And uh, then he, in verse 54, takes the head to Jerusalem and takes it to Saul, I should say. My dad had a saying, if you come back with the head of Goliath, no one will ask you what Bible college you attended. That was his little quote. Well, memories. Okay, is a volunteer motivation and memories. Conclude. The story is about a young man who volunteered, was correctly motivated, and ended up with, a, with the memory of being used of God. Don't you think he reflected on that? How God used that day. I fought a giant. I thought it was tough with a bear. I thought it was tough with a lion. But God let me to, to defeat a giant. Are there giants today? Sure there are. They're spiritual giants, and they stand up to intimidate us. The devil's crowd wants us to accept this wicked society. And it gets wickeder. I mean, who had ever heard of transgender and even thought of that five, ten years ago? And now it's just like that's supposed to be commonplace. Sodomy, abortion, adultery, drug use, alcohol, you can just name all these giants. And they want to call that progressive living. But those type of things will send people to hell, and it's wicked, and it's hated by God. Are times hard in America? Well, was it hard in David's day? It was kind of a hard day. Nobody wanted to stand up. The morale in, the, in Israel's army was pretty low that day when one guy could challenge them and they'd all vacate the battlefield, even as they got ready for battle. Sure. How about another day? Wasn't it kind of hard for the hard day for three Hebrew children when he told them to bow down and they, only three of them were standing? What do you think, Shadrach? Should we sit down? Should we stand up? Should we bow down? No, I'm not bowing down. Yeah, it was a hard day. What about Daniel? What about Gideon's 300 on the hillside? Job said it right. He said this in Job 42.2. I know that thou canst do everything. If we go through this life, even if it's a hard day, and there's sin all around us, we remember God can deliver us. He can use us. I remember this story. I've, I, we played a harmonicas years ago. It's a, a large church. It's right as I'm trying to think what the name of it is. I haven't been there for years, but we were there a number of times. It's on the north side of, uh, of Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, uh, the pastor originally was Brother Hudson. We were there. But then the next pastor was uh, Bradley Price. You, if you've been to a banquet, you've heard Dolphus, you've heard David Price, his, his, uh, his brother, uh, preach. And that, because I've invited him up. But Bradley Price was for years the uh, pastor there at, I can't remember the name of the church. But it's a Baptist church on the north side. And uh, you can see it right off the interstate. Big complex. And uh, he loved to hunt, and he had a heart attack up in, a, in his tree stand. They just gave him up. They got him into the hospital. And, and I, the phrase is what I'm, I'm going for. His wife said, well, when, when she got there to the hospital, how is he? Doctor said, 95% he's not going to make it. She smiled and said, good. That gives God 5%, and he can make it. And God did. God raised him back up, and he got to preach on for many years. Revivals, you know, come during dark days. We talked about that last time we were here. It happens many times, and it happens with young men. This story is with a young man that gave himself to serve God. Pentecost, the Welsh revival. You can name a number of revivals that started with young men. The Lord needs more volunteers. Men like David. The disciples of Christ, we believe, were young men. When I was called to preach, I was a young man. I don't have time to, to deal with that. But, but it's rewarding to serve God. You, you say, okay, well, I'm not young, so that doesn't... No. You may be younger than you think, or not old as you think. B.M. Page, who we talk about and many of us met that are older, a lot of people don't realize he started his ministry when he was 54 years of age. That radio ministry started 54. He continued it for 40 years. Until he was 94 and he died at 98. And he used to come to the college and said, yeah, I had to quit my radio ministry, but I'm on TV now. And uh, I said, do we say TV? He used to preach against that. He said, yeah, don't watch it. He'd say, he, and I didn't have a regular broadcast. He got in with the, with the uh, 
on a very worldly station. That's why I'd say don't watch it. He got the, the station manager liked him. I saw it one time, his advertisement. He would sit in a big chair, and it was like a minute. And it said, um, he, he would sit in that chair. The station man, manager is standing beside him. And he said, man, or he said, people, he said, you need to be saved. And he quotes scripture in that. And he said, if you don't know how to get saved, call me. And he flashed his home number. There's four cell phones and that with him. Flashed his home number. In those last couple of years, he said, you won't believe it, guys. He said, I get, I've won more people to the Lord over the phone than I have for years, he said, in my preaching ministry and that. But he started that at 54 years of old, 54 years of age. If you can't go, you can always pray. And what did Christ say in Matthew 9, 37, 38? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Pray that God will send workers. God will send college students. I've been talking with people in the know the last few days and the last few months. And all of our Bible colleges are way down for preachers. I talked with a fellow, yes, last Sunday at church where I was. was and uh, he said, I went to a um, to a graduation and they didn't have anyone and uh, any preacher boys they had one girl no preacher boys we had two but we need way more than that and uh, pray that God will send forth labors into this harvest we can all pray and we can all give we need motivated volunteers we need motivated volunteers to make memories that will last for eternity let's pray our heavenly father thank you for the few moments we can have together Bless us now in the interim. Give us, uh, speak to us through your word in the worship hour. In Jesus' name, amen.